All right, so for those of you who haven't formally met, I'm Matt Harris, it's nice to meet you. Um, and thank you for sticking with me because this is a tough out. You guys have been given a nap primer in the form of lunch and now you gotta listen to a guy talk about economics for 30 minutes. And that's just not fair to you, so thanks in advance for your patience. Um, a couple of things that have been really positive today is there's way more going on in this state to address the opioid crisis than I knew about before today. It's been beyond impressive and a privilege to hear about the work that, that, that multiple parties around the state are doing. The second thing is that I heard several people, including Dr. Lloyd, uh, Judge Sloan, and Director Roush talking about supply and demand, and that just makes my inter internal econ nerd very happy. Um, as the, the, the slide behind here uh, includes my co-author, Larry Kessler. Larry, if you could raise a hand in the back. Uh, everything I know about uh, the economic impact of opioids I've done in partnership with Dr. Kessler over the last four years. Uh, and so it's, even though he's not up here with me, I wanted him to be on the title slide as well. And when thinking about what to say today to try to make good use of your time, it was a bit of a tough tack to figure out how to take. I don't think I need to convince this room that opioids have an economic impact. That's kind of preaching to the choir. That's why you guys are here. Everybody is here because they believe this is a problem that, that, that warrants our attention. And trying to come up with a specific magnitude for what is the economic impact uh, of opioids on the state also seemed like kind of a poor hill to die on for a few reasons. Um, one is that we don't have adequate data. We still don't have full and complete data to be able to assess the full impact of this. Second is it's really difficult to disentangle correlation and causality. And the reason that I'm up here is because uh, Larry and I have had some success working on those kinds of projects and, and in some cases being able to isolate causal effects. Um, and the third part is that of everything I'm gonna talk about today, almost there is somebody in this room with better institutional knowledge in that area than I have. And so I acknowledge that, that, that the data that I'm working with are subject to limitations, then you guys probably know more about each one of the specific buckets that we're gonna talk about. Um, there we are. So what I... Um, help. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Like I said about anything in here today, somebody's going to have better institutional knowledge than me. So what I thought it made sense was I suspect that many of you in the room may be specialists a bit like I am. And what I thought would make sense is just to talk through some of the different buckets through which uh, opioids have economic impact through these distinct channels. So we know that opioids have economic impact through mortality, through life and death. Uh, Dr. Kessler and I have done some of the first research on how opioids causally affect labor force participation. We know opioids have economic impact through law enforcement, the judiciary, and the correction system. Also through healthcare utilization, through education and human capital formation. And we also, uh, Dr. Kessler and I are doing some early research on how prescription opioids, and more specifically, efforts to reduce prescribing are affecting children and families. And the, the two things that I wanted to spend, to really, really make the goals of the talk, are one, as everybody's talking through best practices tomorrow, I hope that some of the linkages that we can talk about between these areas can, can form the basis or help along some of those discussions about how can everybody work together, how can everybody, how can we all work in concert to best address this. And the second thing is we leave here and go back to our communities. I wanted to provide everybody here some material, some ammunition to be able to make the cold-blooded case for why these programs and why this is worth funding. As uh, the panel on, on dissolving the stigma, I thought just, just had some incredible stories. Um, it's hard to hear some of the things that get said about people with dependency and people with addiction. There's a, uh, a, an acronym that's kind of been reverberating in my head of HSFC which means have some compassion. Um, but in the absence of that, we need to be able to say that this is worth fighting, this is worth doing, and that if we're successful in addressing these problems to the state, here's the prize at the end of the row. Um, so I love that 70 by seven, uh, you know, but, but in the absence of that, let's make the case that, that this is certainly worth doing. Now part of the reason the economic impact of opioids is difficult to assess is usually when you think of an impact, you think of something like a cannonball splash. You think of a single impact, and that impact displaces things. And in some sense, you can measure that displacement, and there you go. Has anybody here ever had the singular experience of throwing a sodium brick into a body of water? 
That's just a Louisiana thing, okay. Um, so my, my high school chemistry teacher may or may not have suffered some mental health issues, uh, but every year she would take a class out to a lake and have a, a sodium brick coated in oil because sodium, as it turns out, is really explosive when it oxidizes and would hurl it into this bayou and it would explode. And so then he'd be waiting for things to calm down and then he'd hear a second explosion because a big chunk of the brick would have gone up and come back down and have a secondary explosion and then a tertiary explosion and then a quaternary explosion. You'd hear four or five of these bangs. And the economic impact of prescription opioids is a lot more like that sodium brick than a cannonball. It doesn't hit one area. It hits several of those areas. And the waves of those areas bounce off each other. But the interaction, the intersection, the linkages between those impacts um, are what I do want to spend most of our time on talking about today. So um, we will talk a bit about magnitudes, but the estimates of these magnitudes vary. And in some cases, are, are just not known because we don't have experimental variation most of the time. We don't have a double-blind randomized control trial. We don't have C-130s flying, flying over and dropping crates of opioids in some jurisdictions, but not others. That's not what we have. It's a social problem. And the incidence of opioids is tightly wound up with everything else that we care about uh, in terms of social factors and demographics. And so trying to get that experimental variation is, is quite difficult. But we do want to get to those linkages and kind of put one caveat that, that, that why you guys are here is really important. Because it has to be the whole puzzle that's gonna solve the opioid crisis. There already is evidence that when uh, efforts to reduce prescribing happen in a vacuum, uh, there are adverse consequences that we can well document. So uh, two things that I think are worth repeating. Um, one comes from a friend of mine, Jason Hockenberry down at Emory. He and I were, were talking some years ago and he had a quote that stuck with me. He said, there's some optimal number um, of opioids prescribed and that number is not zero. So Commissioner Piercy had a, uh, had a, had a comment on that that I wanted, that wanted that to echo. That this, there are people, lots of people, with legitimate chronic pain needs, and we want to make sure those people do get what they need in order to ease their suffering. But at the same point, I think would agree that we're probably well past the optimal number in terms of what's out there now. The second thing is that almost everything we could do is going to be really trading what we call type 1 for type 2 errors. Now, for those of you who are not stats nerds, uh, a type 1 error is when I go to the doctor and the doctor tells me I'm pregnant. A type 2 error is when a pregnant woman goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you're not pregnant. So what we mean is that anything that we do uh, is, is, is in all likelihood going to result in two things. It's going to result in, say, some people who don't need opioids not getting them. It will also result in some people who do need opioids not getting them. And we need to be aware that no matter what we do, there's an exchange rate that comes with that. And it's about trying to find the set of policies and the set of actions that are going to, to give us the best exchange rate. So with all that disclaimer, here's a few, uh, here's what I can tell you about the economic impact of opioids in the state of Tennessee. Um, as uh, as uh, Special Agent in Charge Farmer was, was talking about earlier today, uh, overdose deaths continue to be on the rise. And we hope this is a plateau, um, but as of 2017, there were 1,269 uh, overdose deaths in the state of Tennessee. So, in almost every aspect, Tennessee is weirdly representative of the United States. We're almost exactly 2% of the population. And we're almost exactly 2% of the population in most aspects, in most parts of, of our state, except overdose deaths and a few other indicators too. But we're well north of 2% of, of the total overdose deaths in the United States. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control estimates the, the average net present value, uh, so take all the, all the future benefit, all the future costs, all the future losses from someone passing away from an overdose, and use some discount rate and back it out to the present. CDC estimates that, that each one of those cases is $1.3 million per year. Now, a lot of that uh, impact comes from foregone earnings, uh, from, the, from the labor force participation that that individual uh, does not do, because as Dr. Lloyd said, he can't find a way to treat dead people. Um, similarly, employers have not found a way to, to employ the deceased either. Um, so what we know less about, though, is a couple of things that are equally important. Uh, one is we're not sure about the ripple effects of overdose deaths and family spillovers. We know they can't be good, but there hasn't been a way, no, no rigorous study that I've seen has really, has really quantified those. And so that number leaves that out. The second thing um, is that we don't, we sometimes struggle to think about what's the, what's the correct counterfactual for an overdose death. From an economic perspective, that's a bit tricky because what do we mean by that? So suppose not, 
Suppose somebody does not overdose. It's a very different state of the world if they're getting an ideal course of treatment and they are um, uh, being managed and sort of trying to, I guess, I think, I think rehabilitated is probably a poor choice of words, but it's the one that's stuck in my head at the moment. That's very different versus somebody who's being cut loose back onto the street. And so that economic impact, that 1.3 million, should probably be thought of as, as a lower bound of the best case scenario, where, somebody, where there are th other factors that were not taken into consideration, but somebody is getting the right treatment, they are getting the right follow-up, they are getting the best that evidence-based practices have to offer so that they can live the most fulfilling life that they can. The, the second thing I want to talk about is the economic impact on, uh, on the labor force. So the comprehensive impact is really difficult to measure. And we got involved with this, uh, Dr. Kessler and I did, because a lot of early impact studies focused on the loss of life and the lost productivity through there, but a lot less had been done on the living. And we actually got into this because one of our senior colleagues, uh, Dr. Matt Murray, was going out and doing outreach work in, in counties to the east of here. And business leaders, employers were saying to him, we have jobs. We know there's people not working. But we're not seeing the applications come in. We're not seeing people show up to do the work. Uh, we're hearing about this, this, this opioid thing. Um, is there some truth to that? Is, is this what's causing that? And so, uh, so, so, so we took that seriously. Um, and we were curious about it because particularly in parts of the world where you have a lot of people with, uh, with, with, with chronic ailments and with comorbidities uh, and with chronic pain, there is, from a labor force perspective, the potential for ambiguous effects. Um, it's certainly true that, that to the extent that opioids have therapeutic value, that they can help people who suffer from chronic pain function in order to be able to, to go back to work. Um, and there's, there's been some, some really helpful work done that's looked at Vioxx, that when COX-2 inhibitors were taken off the market, uh, we saw evidence of decreased presenteeism at work and in some cases decreased labor force participation. On the other hand, there's the, um, the negative effects certainly to be concerned about, which is mostly why we're here today. Uh, the concerns about dependence and misuse, reduced labor force participation, et cetera. And so that relationship might look a lot more like heavy alcohol uh, or illicit drug use. As it turns out, light alcohol use looks like it's pretty good for your career. Um, so, so, so what we did, um, that's assuming, of course, that people are telling the truth, right? So in, in Dr. Lloyd's version of the world where no one ever has more than two beers, maybe, maybe we don't take that as seriously. So what we did was we empirically examined the relationship between per capita Schedule II opioids and labor force participation. Uh, we, got, we, we wrote to 50 states and compiled what was at the time, it's amazing how fast data moves sometimes, at the time a novel data set of 10 states. Uh, we're grateful to the Tennessee Department of Health for being the providers uh, for, for the data here in Tennessee. Um, and we chose county level analysis for two reasons. One was data availability. Where there's still, you're, it's still not possible uh, to, to match individual prescribing history to individual labor force data. Uh, we're working to try to, to, to get to more of a micro level, but at the, at the moment, uh, the county is still about as good as we can go. The second thing is, for a lot of, there's been a lot of conversation in the room this morning about diversion, and that's exactly right. So if we want to capture what the effects of, uh, the aggregate effects of opioids and labor market outcomes are, a county is a pretty good measure for two reasons. One is it's a relatively effective proxy um, for somebody's immediate physical network. That, you know, due to the magic of the internet, we have friends across the world, but most of the people we hang out with tend to be in our county. Um, the second is it's a kind of an, a natural area uh, for, uh, for a social networks, but also for opportunities for economic and community development, and to think about, um, about endeavors in that regard. Um, but because not everybody who uses opioids is being prescribed, not everybody who's being prescribed is using all of them, diversion is a big deal but aggregating out to the county level helps us do a better job of, of, of capturing that, aggr that aggregate effect. So I'm gonna apologize for one slide and one slide only, and this is it. This is as hard as I'm gonna nerd today. <laughs> but this is a equation for the relationship between opioids and labor market outcomes controlling for other stuff. And what we really want is that number beta two. That number beta two is gonna be the effect that we wanna to try to find of how opioids affect labor market outcomes. Now, what we need in order to have a snowball's chance in hell of having a good estimate is we need prescription opioids and the unobservable stuff that affects the labor market to be independent. We need them to be unrelated. That's probably not the case. There's sort of a laundry list of things that we can think of that might generate correlations between opioid use and the unobservable mojo that drives the labor market at a county level. 
So what we did for our paper was we called an use what was called an instrumental variables approach. And the basic idea behind um, the, the IV is that we want to find something that is correlated with opioids per capita that's not correlated with the unobservable things that drives the labor market and use that to be able to get the estimate of opioids per capita on labor force participation. So what we did was we used Medicare Part D data uh, to get the national distribution of prescribers and we used a couple of measures of how many prescribers do you have in the, uh, in, in the right tail of the distribution, how many really serious heavy, heavy, heavy prescribers do you have. And the thought experiment behind this is if you were to extract one of these heavy prescribers from the county, is opioids per capita going to change? Yes. Is the unobservable mojo that drives the labor market going to change? No, probably not. And what we found from this was was shocking to us that, that at the mean, a 10% increase in opioids prescribed per capita led to a 0.56 percentage point decrease in labor force participation. And so putting that into real terms, in terms of what it means, that means that, that the run-up in opioid prescribing from 2000 to present would have been enough to explain about half of the decline in labor force participation that we've, that we've seen over that span. And so what we think about what that means in Tennessee, because this was a multi-state uh, analysis, a 10% decrease in prescription opioid use we estimate would lead to an increase of $825 million in personal income. And that's a lot. And that's not distributed evenly over the state either. Uh, so when we consider that uh, we have up here a chart of county by county, sort of a heat map of if you were to successfully decrease opioid prescribing by 10% in each one of these counties, what would happen to personal income? Uh, this projector actually does this color scheme good, which is great. You see that the median answer up here is most of the modal answer Generally speaking, opioid prescribing would lead to an increase in personal income on the order of $120 to $150 per head in most counties. And that's real money. That's a big economic impact. But there's even more that we still don't know that we struggle to understand. For example, so uh, Dr. Kessel and I wrote that paper, which, yay, good for us. We also know um, that there's these dynamics that happen between labor force participation and economic development. So when you have a thriving workforce, you're a better place for business to locate. When businesses locate to your county, people tend to re-enter the workforce because there's better jobs and better opportunity. So what we know less about is the extent to which uh, either A, uh, economic development averts opioid usage. There's anecdotes and success stories that we can point to, but the plural of anecdote is not data, that we can't yet causally identify that relationship. By the same token, there's stories but we also, it's less clear to the extent to which opioid use has effects beyond what we're picking up because we're not capturing that having a reputation as an opioid hotbed may not make you a favorable location for business. Trying to estimate that is worth doing, but it's something that we're still struggling to be able to do. Um, so when we think about the economic impact of, um, of, uh, of law enforcement, judiciary, and corrections, uh, the, the, the two numbers that I pulled up here were, were number of, of felons incarcerated per year from Tennessee Department of Corrections website. And as our friends from, uh, from, uh, uh, from TBI pointed out this morning, uh, a lot of the blue, a lot of the other is not opioids. That's also amphetamines and other substances going on there too. Um, but what do we know about the economic cost of that? Well, um, for starters, we know that the, the crime is very costly. And, you know, the, uh, the, the story that Ms. Cliff told this morning is... Um, stops you right in your tracks, doesn't it? Um, drug crimes directly affect people's lives. They also affect property costs. They also require people to take measures they otherwise wouldn't in order to protect themselves and their property and their family. Uh, we also know that the enf uh, enforcement of costly. That in a world without a prescription opioid epidemic, our friends in the in law enforcement community would be able to use those resources to address other problems. We also know that incarceration is costly. And so in terms of what it costs operationally to uh, incarcerate somebody, Tennessee Department of Corrections would give you a much better number than whatever guesstimate I could put up here. Uh, Judge Sloan was kind enough to forward me an article done by a group at RTI. And the principal there, uh, Gary Zarkin, uh, on that project has shown that, that diverting people from, uh, from prison into treatment, as, uh, as Judge Sloan is known for doing as well, uh, has, has been shown to be highly cost effective. Uh, in terms of the magnitude for Tennessee, I struggle to cook you up a specific estimate for that just because I don't have enough data to be able to do that. But we know that keeping people out of prison is, 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 uh, is, is highly cost effective and helpful. But a lot of the opportunity cost in, uh, 
And so, uh, ma'am, you're the uh, peer, uh, peer recovery specialist who spoke earlier, right? You're absolutely right. That one of the things that often gets omitted from the cost of incarceration is that if somebody's incarcerated, they're not working. Or they are working, they're not being paid for it. And they're not contributing to the tax base. And so that's a big economic cost that doesn't get talked about. The other thing, too, we know is that the dynamic costs matter a lot. If somebody has a felony conviction that's, that's on them, they're 10% less likely to be employed through the balance of their life, and also they're likely to be working for lower wages. Uh, and so in audit studies, people with felony convictions, so an audit study, by the way, is kind of interesting. That's where, where a group will send a bunch of resumes out to a bunch of companies and see who gets a call back. And people who signal they have a felony conviction are 50% likely to get a call back. So not only does incarceration from drug crimes have operational costs and but line accounting costs, it has economic costs well beyond that. And if you extrapolate that forward over the life cycle, what it truly costs the GDP of Tennessee to incarcerate somebody is massive. And so if we can avoid that, so much the better. Um, one of the things that we don't know as much about is, is we don't fully understand yet how incarceration affects the families and how it affects the children and how those co costs compound over the life cycle. Um, but understanding that as a key component to getting to something closer to the full picture of, of, of what this opioid epidemic is doing to our state on economic terms. When we talk about NAS births, um, that's hard to look at. There's the, the, the numbers still climbing. In 2017, there were 1,090 NAS births. Um, among hospital costs for an infant with NAS, they averaged $19,340. So in about an additional $16,000 just in hospital costs compared to a child without NAS births. And as um, the Director Roush and, and, and Judge Sloan earlier shared, that, 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 that it doesn't stop there. There are significant costs that happen over the course of that child's first year and beyond that. Uh, children born with NAS are 33% more likely to have educational disabilities uh, requiring classroom therapy uh, and other concerns. And the thing to remember is most of these studies are happening on a relatively young cohort. The children who were able to finally see the educational outcomes and what it means for NAS are at the most about 10, year, 10 or 11 years old. The true long-term life cycle cost for that, we're not gonna unfortunately know that for probably another 10 to 20 years. It's gonna take longer to still extrapolate to what the full cost of that, of that means. And the other thing I want to I think about that, that's worth addressing the opioid epidemic is Tennessee's on the verge of, or at least there's efforts underway to convert Medicaid into a block grant. And over time, that will lead to slower increases in the amount of federal money that comes into the state for Medicaid. And if you have more babies being born with natal, natal abstinence syndrome, and those babies are very extensive, expensive to treat, 80% of those babies are happening on Medicaid, and that spreads the budget a lot thinner for other babies, for other people who need care, and puts a much greater economic burden on the state. Um, in terms of the economic impact of health care, um, Curtis Florence and colleagues at the CDC estimate that they're based on a match sample, so they're controlling for uh, what co comorbidities you have. They're controlling for demographic, controlling for health state, et cetera. They find that individuals who are opioid dependent cost about an additional $15,500 on average to treat per year. If we extrapolate that to the estimated number of opioid dependents in Tennessee, assuming we're nationally representative, which we're probably worse than nationally representative, that's another $617 million in healthcare costs that we're ringing up over the course of the year. Uh, one of the things that I've been, I've been grateful for the discussion that's happened around ACEs this morning. I think that's absolutely vital and it's something that we need to talk about. Uh, aside from the harrowing emotional impact, ACEs is also really economically expensive. Uh, estimates of the lifetime cost of adverse childhood experiences like sexual assault and violence range from 200 grand to 800 grand. Um, so Dr. Castle and I as a follow-up sort of said, okay, well we have this, this clever way to identify the causal effect of opioids. Let's take a look at what's happening with opioids and child maltreatment. And what we found was, uh, was, was we used much stronger words than perplexing. Uh, it was really confusing. We found that opioids looked like they were doing good for child maltreatment. And in a world as saturated in opioids as we are, um, it, it, that didn't seem right. So we decided to dig a bit deeper. And I'm sure most of the room probably knew, we were probably the last ones to know, again, back to the institutional knowledge thing, that although overdose deaths and our awareness of opioids has continues to increase, Opioid prescribing, prescription opioid prescribing peaked about seven years ago. And we see the same pattern if we take a look at the data that we have to be able to do the analysis, um, that opioid prescribing peaked around 2010 or 2012. And what you see is in, 
I wish this graph were scaled a bit better, but you see there's a, a bit of a trough here, and there's a bit of a kink there. But long about the time that opioid prescribing peaks, you see this uptick in allegations and substantiated cases of child maltreatment. So what we thought we had was something closer to this conversation. Um, so my parents, so this is me dating myself, I'm 40, and my parents took me to see Ghostbusters in the theater when I was like five. I didn't realize it was a comedy for like another 13 years, like when you're a five. <laughs> When you're a five-year-old, that's actually pretty scary. So there's this, there's this great conversation between Egon and Walter Peck from the EPA, and Walter Peck's coming in and saying, you have this dangerous containment unit, shut it off. Egon's saying, there might be some danger here, but if you shut it off, it's gonna get a whole lot worse. And they didn't listen, and they did shut it off. And things got a whole lot worse. And what we're seeing is some evidence that attempts to shut it off in a vacuum are generating adverse consequences as well. So in terms of prescription drug monitoring programs, the good news is they have been effective in reducing Schedule II opioids. And there's evidence shows, as some shows, that, that, that they reduce foster care admissions. But implementation of PDMPs has also led to, to increased heroin-related crimes in counties with high opioid use. So at the time the PDMP goes into effect, it's not a level playing field. You have some cases, places with relatively low levels of dependence and some places with much worse areas of dependence. And as you would expect, the adverse consequences of, putting, of restricting opioids are worse in places with entrenched dependence. The reformulation of OxyContin, uh, the concept probably partially because it happened earlier, before there was as, 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 well, as great of a level of awareness of the need for support structures, the consequences of that were quite a bit used. Uh, there's increased heroin use, increased heroin overdose deaths, and increased hepatitis C incidents in the aftermath of the reformulation of OxyContin. And so as we controlled for kind of an unobserved initial conditions problem. Uh, we looked at the reformulation of OxyContin, and we said, okay, um, let's take a look during that part where prescriptions are falling and child maltreatment is on the uptick. What we found was that in places with low opioid dependence, there was no relationship uh, between time and child maltreatment. But in places with high levels of opioid dependence, the results we have so far suggest that as opioid prescribing falls due to the policies that have gone in place to reduce prescribing, that one side effect that we're seeing is increased child maltreatment. Um, we're not clear on the mechanism. I, I do think substitution to worse substances is, is one candidate mechanism. It's also true that I think just withdrawal and distress if people are cut off from the thing that they're dependent on. Um, I have three kids. I have a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. Uh, and. I love them with all my heart, and they try my patience to the limit daily. I can't imagine trying to do that going through withdrawal. Um, but in terms of this paper, um, you know, uh, Commissioner Piercy, I'd love to talk about this with you offline uh, and uh, get your take on what we're finding and what else we should be looking at. Uh, we're working on this paper in, in very real time. We, uh, we also are trying to evaluate how the implementation of a must-access PDMP affects child maltreatment. We also want to know if we can triangulate these adverse family outcomes uh, using data from, um, uh, from, from, the, from FBI and from UCR to look at arrests for one arrays and domestic violence. And we're also interested in how does accessibility of MAT uh, and, and other alternative therapies, how does it mitigate the adverse consequences of those reduced supply as part of our efforts to, to help guide the conversation on what the, what, what the ideal bucket of services is to have to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to address this thing. So, um, you know, in terms of the key takeaways from this, uh, the main one is that there, there are substantial economic gains to be had from a number of fronts from addressing this epidemic. If you want a number, uh, I'll be happy to give you a number. I'd rather not do it here. Come find me outside. I'll tell you what my best guess is, but I'll tell you there's also a hell of a confidence interval around that just because there's a whole lot that we still don't know, but it's big. Uh, the second thing is that, that all these facets of our population are, are in, inexorably linked. And evidence has shown that for any solution to be effective, each of these components has to go into place mindful of how these things are linked and mindful of how these, how these factors are interrelated. So the work that, uh, that, that Matt Yancey and his team are doing is fantastic. The work that, uh, that, that, that Dr. Lloyd uh, is, is, is doing is fantastic. Uh, the work that our friends from the judiciary system, like Judge Sloan and our friends from TBI are doing are fantastic. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Piercy, Dr. Pack, um, it all has to be able to work together. It all has to be able to come together or adverse consequences are gonna slip through the cracks and be a big problem with that. Now, the one caveat, and I have to just offer this, is that um, 
No matter what plans of action come from this, the one thing we know from empirical research on behavioral interventions and for experiments is that people sometimes respond to things in unanticipated ways. Uh, about two years ago, I taught my kids about the virtue of saving and gave them piggy banks so they could start you know, putting away a few nickels, dimes, and quarters and things like that. And they were uh, messing around in the front seat of my car while I was cleaning out the garage, and they decided to start saving. I realized they were saying, banking, banking, banking. What they were doing was taking all of my loose change and shoving it in my tape deck. So sometimes lessons that we impart to try to have positive nudges respond in unanticipated ways. On a much more harrowing note, there's, there's stories of, of uh, places where fecal illness is a problem and property rights are a problem and well-meaning uh, uh, health and developing countries types have gone in and built privies to contain fecal illness and have come back and they've seen an increased mortality because of property right concerns people have used the privies as chicken coops and that sort of passes things around. So sometimes you don't always get the behaviors that you're gonna respect. And even ev solid evidence-based practices may have unanticipated spillovers. Um, there's been some evidence that, some early evidence that, that syringe exchange programs in some cases have led to increases in HIV. There's been a paper by uh, Anita Mukherjee and Jennifer Doliak that was controversial that showed that, that uh, increased access to naloxone led to increased uh, overdose deaths, and partly because I think that, that naloxone was happening in a vacuum without people having the support structure around that we need, and that comes back to why this has to happen together, that you are in the right room, and this has to be a cohesive solution. Um, Judge Sloan earlier said that he'd be shocked if the number came back at less than five to one ROI uh, in terms of what investing in recovery would do for economic gain. And I think that's probably right, but I don't think that's gonna happen immediately. There's gonna be some challenges, there'll be fits and starts, there'll be issues with scalability, there'll be issues with fidelity. Um, and anytime I give an economic uh, impact talk about investing in health, the phrase that I always say is health is a long game. The gains down the road are massive, but it takes time for the dynamics to be able to work for you. And so uh, if I can help you make that case, uh, let me know. The two things that I'll tell you that we as economists can be useful for um, is that we're really good at getting causal inference out of non-experimental data. So if you need to be able to know the effect of A on B, but you don't have a double-blind trial, call Dr. Kessler or I. We'll be happy to see if we can help. The second thing is that as you go to uh, implement programs, economists are often helpful as program evaluators. So there's other people who can do that too, but if we can help, please let us know. And thank you guys very much for sitting through an econ talk after lunch.